So even though this training is about comprehension, um, we're going to spend a few minutes talking about some of the other components related to reading. Because um, when students have difficulty comprehending what they're reading or what they're listening to, um, we immediately jump and assume it's, oh, they have weak comprehension skills. But it may actually be that they have problems in some of the other areas of reading that um, by having problems in those area, areas, it's affecting their ability to get to the ultimate goal of reading, which is comprehension. So what I'm going to do now, and I'm going to use these colored ribbons here, um, I'm going to go through something that's often called the five components of reading. And I'm going to demonstrate them or talk about them with you using these colored ribbons because uh, after I review all of them, I want you to see how they all end up working together like strands in a rope. So let's begin with the very first one, which is um, phonemic awareness. Now, phonemic awareness is something that uh, is, if it's, when it's taught, it's usually taught in pre-K, K, first, second grade. Most students beyond those grades never need any instruction in phonemic awareness. Um, however, there are some older students, especially those that have language-based learning disabilities, that that's a significant cause of their struggling, their, their reason for struggling. Um, and so you may sometimes have older students that need work in this. But primarily, this is something that gets taught um, when children are very young. Now, what is phonemic awareness? It has uh, the root word phoneme in it. And a phoneme is what we call the smallest unit of sound that you can make in a language. Um, and by the way, there are 44 phonemes in the English language. So each of those sounds, when you combine them together, end up making words. And when we hear a word, we don't realize we're doing it, but when we hear a word, we are parsing out those individual sounds. We're hearing those sounds. We automatically glom them together, and it stands for a word. And then it allows us to start thinking about the word and going to what we know the word means, et cetera. Now, when you ask students to do a phonemic awareness task, it's something that you could do with the lights out, meaning you don't have to have sound for this. So I'm going to do a little practice activity. And what I want you to do right now is I want you to close your eyes. And I'm going to say a word. And then I'm going to ask you some questions. So close your eyes. OK. So the word is cat. What's the first sound you hear? K. What's the last sound you hear? T. What's the middle sound you hear? A. Ah. Now if we put them all together, what do we get? We get cat. OK. Now, what if we were to exchange um, uh, the last sound, the t sound, and put a p sound there? What would you hear? You now would have the word cap. So you just did a phonemic awareness activity. You were able to identify, isolate the sounds in the word, also put them together. You were also able to manipulate the sounds in the word. And so that's all that phonemic awareness is. Um, now, why is this related to reading? Because since ours is an alphabetic language and we use letters to represent sounds in the words that we speak, um, if students aren't able to detect those sounds, those nuances in the sounds, and pull them apart and put them back together, then it's going to be really hard for them to learn the system of our alphabetic system, which is letters or combinations of letters represent those sounds. So that's why it's so essential. So that's our first building block. The second one, and we'll use red to represent this, this is phonics. Now, when you move to phonics, um, you have to do phonics with the lights on because you need to see. So the, the big difference here is that with phonemic awareness, the focus is sounds. And with phonics, the focus is letters that represent those sounds. So um, you know, we all know that in English, we have 26 letters in our alphabet. Um, but I mentioned that we have 44 sounds we can make. So there's a disjoint there. We only have 26 letters, but they need to represent 44 sounds. Um, and the way we do that is that we sometimes combine letters. So if I combine TCH, um, and that makes a ch sound, or CH can make a 
ch or k sound. So that's how we do it. Now the fascinating thing, and this is what makes phonics so hard for, for our students, and that is that because ours is a language that layers many languages on top of each other over hundreds of years, as we added new languages, we often kept the original spellings. And so we end up now with this unbelievable number of ways to spell those 44 sounds. There are more than 200. And that's why spelling is so difficult in the English language. OK, so phonemic awareness, phonics, we see the combination. We see um, how important they are, how, how they're related. But again, the question is, what does this have to do with comprehension? Well, these two, along with fluency, which we're going to talk about next, are the components that we put in the category called decoding. The ability to, when you see a word, figure out what it is. And to be able to do that accurately and rapidly and hopefully without having to think about it. And that's a precursor to being able to then think about the information that you're reading. Now again, like with phonemic awareness, this is something that usually by the end of third grade, we want kids to have this whole system figured out. You know, the end of third grade, beginning of fourth grade so that they know the basic combinations, how the letters represent the sounds, and when they see these words, they automatically get them, okay? Um, and you want them to get to the point where they're fluent in doing that. And so that brings us to our third component. I'm gonna use the yellow ribbon for this. If you're wondering why I'm, I'm uh, weaving them together, it's because in the end, I want you to show, show you how even though we're talking about them as separate entities, that in the end, they all work together um, like the strands in a rope when we end up reading. OK, so fluency. What can we say about fluency? Um, well, first, let's think about fluency as something not just associated with reading, right? So whenever you learn something new, um, let's say you're learning to play golf, um, or last year I took up knitting, right? Um, you're not good at it at first. And what is it that makes us good at it? It's the practice. And we want the practice to be guided practice, right? So um, I'm not going to learn to play golf if somebody just tells me, here's how you swing the golf club, and they explain it to me. Or I'm not really going to learn to get good at knitting if somebody says, oh, here's how it works. You take two needles, and you, you, know, you, you go left, then you go right, and then you right. Um, I need to, number one, watch somebody doing it. That's what we call modeling. Um, preferably, if the person can actually think it aloud while they're showing me, that would be great. But even that, that's, that's just where I learn initially how to do something. It's the practice that makes it work, right? So even if I have the greatest golf instructor, you know, or even if I'm able to uh, go to a knitting class and they do an excellent job of teaching me how to knit, when I go home, I look up at the ceiling and I go, now I don't know what to do. And it's the practice that makes it work. And it's the guided practice, because that's the other thing. Because if I start practicing the, sw the golf swing the wrong way, and um, and, and you know my balls are going way to the left or way to the right, and I don't get somebody to guide me and show me how to adjust that, um, I'm not going to learn to improve that golf swing. So this is the exact same approach to reading. The way we get better at that, um, that decoding skill, that ability when we see words, regardless of how they, long they are, to as quickly and efficiently as possible decode the word. Look at those letters, translate them into the sounds, translate it into a word so we can start focusing on the meaning. We want that to be as rapid and automatic as possible. We want to be as accurate because we don't want to misread the words. Um, and so a lot of folks will think about reading fluency as something that involves accuracy and speed. But it's not just those two things because we've all seen kids who read very rapidly and then they're done at the end and they can't remember anything. And that's because they're not focusing on also trying to make sense out of what they're reading. So there are usually two other factors or components to fluency, and those are what we call prosody. Um, and prosody is just a fancy way of saying the sort of sing-song and the pauses that we make when we're speaking. It's, it's the recognition when you see a comma that it's time to stop and pause a minute. Um, and then, in addition to prosody, we're also looking for with some understanding. So the definition of fluency, reading fluency, is to read words accurately, quickly, with prosody, and with an eye for comprehension. So these three 
components all come under the area of what we call decoding and fluency. It's the part that really doesn't have much to do with making meaning when we're reading. It's, it's the sort of rudimentary aspects that, again, by the time kids leave fourth or fifth grade, you want this to be down pat. Okay, so now let's think about these last two, which are vocabulary and comprehension skills. These are the, um, the components of reading that what are, make reading what it's all about, which is being able to read to make meaning. So this first one, which I'm using blue to represent, is vocabulary. And by the way, vocabulary and comprehension are completely connected. They're like, you know, love and marriage, soup and sandwich, um, go together, right? So, but vocabulary um, plays a very unique role. One of the findings that we've had from research, and it's been replicated over and over again, is that when we're reading something, if we're not familiar with at least 95% of the words in a piece of text that we're reading, it's going to affect our comprehension. And I know that that seems like a pretty high number, but a lot of the words in text are words that don't make much meaning, like a uh and the, okay? But it's those really key, important words, content-related words, that make, make up the meaning. And all you need is to not know what a few of those are, and it's going to throw everything off. So vocabulary is very much related to comprehension. Um, and if students have weaknesses in that vocabulary, that's really going to throw their meaning off. Now, let's go to our last one, which is what this training is all about, right, which is comprehension. And I'm using our multicolored ribbon here because comprehension is really relies on all these other things that we've been talking about. So in this case, we want to ask ourselves, what is comprehension? And even that can be broken down into several components. Um, several of which we're going to focus on in our training for the key comp routine today. Um, but um, several that are equally as important, but not necessarily something that we're going to cover in the training. So the four um, subcomponents, if you will, of comprehension are vocabulary, which we talked about already, strategies, metacognitive strategies. So that's Things like, um, you know, in the routine, things like how do you find main ideas and state them? How do you take notes? How do you write summaries? How do you generate questions? So those are all considered strategies that good readers use. So we've got vocabulary, we've got strategies. Another one is background knowledge. If you come to read something and you have no background knowledge in it whatsoever, it's going to affect your comprehension. The more you already know about the subject you're reading about, the easier it's going to be to make sense of what you're reading. Because first of all, it means you're going to have more vocabulary that you know. But you're also going to have what we call a schema, um, a collection of ideas already related to that topic. And you can hook this new information onto it. So that's strategies. And the last one is text structures. And this is something that most folks don't think about much as it relates to comprehension. But text structures start right at the sentence level. So when we're reading something, and if it has a really long, complex, you know, compound sentence in it, sometimes the fact that it's that um, difficult affects our comprehension. So a lot of your students who are having trouble understanding what they're reading, it might not be that they can't understand the concepts. It's that the language that's being used in what they're reading is so complex that they can't get at the meaning. Um, so those are the four components of comprehension. So let's wrap the whole thing up together now. So I've shared with you five components of reading here. And I want you um, to think about them as strands in a rope. Now, what happens in a real rope if one or two of the strands break or are frayed? It hurts the integrity of the whole rope. And so that's how I want you to think about these, that you know, even though we can talk about them as separate components, um, in reality, when we read, we do them all together. And a good reader flows between these effortlessly. They're tapping into decoding skills, they're, they're using their fluency, they're going to word meaning, and ultimately to larger meaning. So um, again, the reason I'm sharing these components with you is, even though we're going to focus primarily on comprehension here, um, when you see students who struggle with that, you want to stop and ask yourself, is the problem really their comprehension 
you know, that they don't have strategies or enough background knowledge or text structure? Or is it something else, that they can't decode the words or they can't do them fluently enough? Or could it be that they just don't know what enough of the vocabulary is? So that's the five components of reading.